and a woman, woman, woman in every way. Yeah, yeah, I'm living my life, 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 living day by day. Yeah, yeah. Are you in Welcome every to Every Way Woman. woman. There are some major changes happening in the talk show world. Live from Los Angeles, here's Every Way Woman. Woman. So, ladies, I want to talk about what it's like to be different in a culture that expects you to follow the norm beyond race, and of course, including race. Mm -hmm. You know, Amber, you're you're different. Well, I'm different. You you are. <laughs> <laughs> you're different. I'm an American woman. You no, know, you you've gone above and beyond what was you know maybe expected of you in mm -hmm. ways, and you've really been a true trailblazer in your community, and mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I mean, what I was that like for you? First of all, I stand on shoulders of a lot of African American women and men. Um, I think for me and my family, they want to stay in their small city, and I just saw a bigger picture. Um, That's what I meant when I said you're different. Yeah. You saw the bigger well, picture. They know I'm crazy. You know, my family know I'm crazy. <laughs> but I mean, my thing is, I don't want to be different. I mean, I, I like being different, but I, I think normal to me is different. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. Yeah, and that's, I, know, I, kind of, yeah. I grew up in a military family, so we moved around a lot. Oh. And so there wasn't really some, a norm. There wasn't a norm. Nothing right. was normal when I was growing up. I found out that I wasn't normal by talking to normal people. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I learned. Um, but I mean, I'm being um, a mix. Sometimes mm -hmm. I can blend into. What, what do you mix with? Well, I'm Korean and Irish. Wow. But when I, li I lived in a Latin community, um, when I first came to, came to LA and I went to the grocery store and everyone was Spanish. And I, I was just trying to pick fruit. I didn't understand what some of the things were. Spanish. They spoke to me in Spanish, and I go, I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish. And this one man got so upset with me, and going off in Spanish. And I'm looking at him like, I, I don't speak Spanish. I'm sorry. I, did I say something? And he goes, why are you trying to be somebody you're not? Why do you think you're trying to be white? Why are you letting go of your culture? Why are you this and this and this? And I go, he thought it was half Spanish. Mm. Oh, wow. And I, I remember looking at him going, I'm, I'm Korean. And I had to speak in Korean. I was like, no, I'm not at all. No, I'm not at all. And he's looking at me like, wow. You know, and he kind of walked away. Huh. Well, now that, I mean, now that you're talking about the Latino community, mm -hmm. I think in the Latino community, um, what's the older generation? It's like you have to be married. You have to have children. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, I always get that when I go to parties. Ay, mi hija, no estás casada todavía. No tienes hijos. Ay, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, which I, it, it already passed, you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I get offended. I'm like, I don't want to have children. I don't want to get married right now, you so, know? Mm -hmm. What do you mean it already passed? Like, That's the, what they tell you. Well, I, about, made. well I worry about that. And I always tell my mom, I was like, Feel like a spinster because I grew up in the Midwest in a very conservative community where most of the people were married by the age of 22, had a baby by 25, um, and I left four days after college, moved cross country. I'm not married. I don't have a child. I'm not going to 30 wondering what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And I'm a black sheep. I'm like a crazy spinster. But you, but you know what though? I've always, you know, even just within my family, I've always been considered the one who, uh, you know what, depending on depending on the mood of how they're addressing me, I'm either the one that marches to the beat of my own drum, mm -hmm. or you know, if they're in a less you know, benevolent mood, then I'm the crazy one. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always been comfortable doing my own thing. But I think African American culture is different. Oh, um, absolutely. We we don't we look at life like be happy, go after what it is you need to do, and take care of your business. And so I think sometimes we get the stereotype of saying, you know what, oh, African Americans don't do this, or African Americans don't do that. And because I think that's a myth. Sometimes we, sometimes we do step out the boundaries and we go for it, you know? You know what, you're absolutely right, because I can't tell you how many people looked at me with a side eye question mark when I told them that this, this past February I, I went to Japan to go snowboarding. They're like, <laughs> wait a minute. Huh? You went all the way. Wait, I mean, did they look at you like that? Did they look at you like that? And I can't tell you, right? I can't tell you how difficult it is to get some African American friends yeah. to go camping with me. It you is. know, but friends I think, of other I think our generation now is a little bit different because we have a little more freedom and um, we see life a little bit different instead True. of in the confined segregation kind of, you know. You know I have to that, say you know, that yeah. social media in that way I think has been so eye opening. 
Mm-hmm. Because true. we get to see how other other cultures live. Not mm-hmm. just yeah, other true. cultures, but other cultures get to see what we no, do. No, no, no. Right. They don't really get to see it. They get to see an idealized version. They get to see what we present to of them. Of what we present to them. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Not, yeah, anymore. Not, not anymore. anymore. Not anymore. But you know what, though? Not so, with us, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I, mean, I think some of the younger ones are kind of turning into the TMI generation. So with them, really? with the young... Yeah, with the younger ones, you get on their social media. It's like, why would you tell that to people? Well, yeah. I, mean, I mean, they just, well, they're too open. I know, they're, there's right. a lot of things, but there's good things too. True. Okay. Like us. It, 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 like <laughs> us. But it is interesting too, because in some ways, then instead of people wanting to be different, they're seeing what they want to do and what they want to be like everybody else. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think I want to raise my children with their culture, letting them know who they are, but then also letting them know they're not bound to right. the structure yeah. that society put on them. You exactly. can go Absolutely. and you can be whoever be you want to be mm-hmm. and still mm-hmm. be proud African-American and still be who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. More when we return. After this commercial break, more Every Way Woman. Are you in every way woman? Are you in every way woman? Dr. Sherry Thomas is here to talk about a little gynecology 101, which you should and should not expect in your appointment. Dr. Sherry, you guys are a little scary. You know that, right? (laughs) Just going to a gynecologist is always going to be scary. We love you, but you are a little scary. We try to make it a little less scary. (laughs) But listen, really, why should women go to a gynecologist? Well... Of course, when you become sexually active, you want to start seeing a gynecologist. Mm-hmm. And if you're under 21, your daughter will tell you, Mom, I'm tired of seeing the pediatrician. I'm ready to see a gynecologist. Now, what, what, I start out by saying it's scary. What should I expect, especially in my first visit to a gynecologist? What should I expect? Well, you should expect to have your doctor talk to you about your history, your family history, uh, and all the other things that your primary care doctor, if you aren't seeing them yet, will talk to you about your vaccinations, your um, health history, are you mm-hmm. exercising, are you eating well, do you smoke? They'll talk to you about that. And then they'll ask you if you have any concerns, any reason you specifically came to see them. Have you been recently sexually active and maybe you were worried you might have a sexually transmitted disease? So I have a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old, and I don't believe they're sexually active. But when should I introduce them to the gy- a gynecologist, have them have a pelvic exam or a pap smear? That's a great question for most parents of children, women that you wonder, when are my little girls going to start being sexually active? I'm sure you've talked a little bit of, to them about sexual activity. I have. And um, they'll see a pediatrician every year up until they're about 18. But there's a transition between the pediatrician and a gynecologist where you can ask your daughters, gee, would you be interested in seeing a gynecologist? That means there's more that they want to talk about with a gynecologist, and that's a great start. But you know, Dr. Thomas, there's an illusion that the gynecologist is only for when they're sexually active, but we both know that cervical cancer and other things can come out of a pap smear and out of a a pelvic exam, right? So they don't know about that, so how do I talk to them about that? Well, cervical cancer and abnormal pap smears are later in life. Okay. Most women aren't going to have a pap smear before 21. Okay. Um, so that you won't need to worry about. If a young girl is having gynecologic issues, a vaginal discharge, or okay. something her pediatrician can't help, then they will refer you to a gynecologist. But most girls between the ages of about 16 to 21 become sexually active, and that's when they should think about seeing a gynecologist or if, if their primary mm-hmm. health care provider does pediatrics and also sees adult women, that's a great transition they don't even have to make. So when I'm at the gynecologist, is there anything that I shouldn't share with you? When I come in to see you, doctor, is there anything I shouldn't share with you? Oh, you should find a <laughs> gynecologist you can share everything with. Okay. Because it's so important that you are able to tell that doctor everything. Mm-hmm. That's how we help you if you are having an extramarital affair, uh, if you wow. had an unwanted sexual experience, we need to know so that we can help you right away. Now, is there a certain age that I don't have to see you anymore? 
that I'm done. <laughs> no more plastic clamps. Is there a certain age? It's not after that first exam as you would like it to be. <laughs> so there is a point when if a woman's had a hysterectomy mm -hmm. that she doesn't need a pap smear. Um, but at 65, if she stops having, has, has had pap smears that mm -hmm. are all normal, she can stop having pap smears. But a pelvic exam is very important. We detect things like rectal cancers okay. and other pelvic masses. So I recommend you have a pelvic exam every couple of years, the rest of your life, whether you have a pap smear or not. And how do I look for a gynecologist? Since I give you, I'm giving you my heart, how do I look for it? Oh, that's a great, great question. Well, I, when you move into an area, I'd ask your girlfriends, who do you see? Okay. Then I'd look online, check the doctor's credentials. There's so many different evaluations of physicians where you can see if people like a particular doctor or not. And it also tells you where we went to school okay. and um, if we actually practice in that area. For example, as a gynecologist, some of us are just general OBGYNs, mm -hmm. but say you need an infertility problem, it'll give you that doctor's credentials, wow. or an oncologist for a cancer, or for pelvic surgery, incontinence or prolapse, that's what I do. And you can see our credentials, see what we treat. And so in treat. essence, my gynecology, gynecologist is actually my good friend, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. In order to take care of others, you have to take care of yourself. Stay tuned to Everyday Woman. We'll be back with Everyday Fitness. Are you an Everyday Woman? Are you an Everyday Woman? Alright, so coming up, Heather is going to be talking to us about body blueprint. I have no idea what that is, do you? Find out right here at Everyway Woman. When you start working with a personal trainer, they need to do a whole body assessment. Our fitness expert, Heather Benz, is here to tell us about her body blueprint that she does with all her clients. What is a body blueprint? Well, for me, it's the term that I give to the complete fitness assessment that I do with my clientele. So, for example, not only does it involve a body fat assessment and a strength assessment, which is common for most trainers, but in addition, I do a cardiovascular assessment, a flexibility assessment, a physical imbalance assessment, and a functional movement screen to really make sure I can make the perfect program for each and every client. So is that like day one, they, they need to do this with you? Yes, it's the first appointment. Okay, and, and so what kinds of things do they need to do for you to assess all these items? Uh, first, show up, just dress <laughs> comfortably, that's the key. And then it's nothing to be afraid of, it's nothing scary, and it's nothing that it requires a lot of work and causes any pain or anything. It's just me putting them through a series of movements so I can see how their body moves, what's happening in each joint area, so I can not only get them to their goal, whether it may be fat loss or building muscle or training for a race, but at the same time helping prevent injury in the future because I'm correcting those dysfunctional movements patterns and the imbalances that we have from everyday life. Absolutely. So I don't need to like cram on push-ups if I'm no. meeting you for the first time. <laughs> well, not cram on push-ups, but you may do some. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, I definitely have knee problems that, you know, I'm, I'm prone to those back problems. Are those things that you can tell? Yes. Exactly. Based on when we do the screening and how your body moves and the certain movements that I have you go through, it's going to tell me what muscles are underactive or overactive. And basically what that means is which muscles are firing all the time and other muscles are not hardly firing at all. So that we can create more of a balance in that muscular system in your body so that we can put you back in one piece so you're moving properly and you're not causing any pain and hopefully no longer feeling the pain that you were before. How much do your shoes matter in, in you know, your gait and all of that? Well, in regards to running, it's extremely important to have uh, the right running shoes for running because you have to get a gait analysis, and that's exactly the word to use. I'm surprised <laughs> not everyone knows that. Well, you know, because I have my knee problem, so I wonder about that. Good, like, good. You know, do you, so when you're doing the assessment, do you say, okay, you run a certain way, you need to get a different shoe before I can even start working with you? Is well, that that's, involved? That's more on the running side. In the side of doing the body blueprint and everything, that's more when I'm having a client come to me for whatever it may be, strength training. Sometimes it is, it is range training, but then I send them to a running specialist that can actually do the gait analysis on them. I can, I can see the precursors of it, but I actually let someone else do that who specializes in running shoes. I don't specialize in running shoes, but I get them there. 
But so so that's not important with strength training to have Well, you do want the right shoe. Okay. But it's not necessarily um, one that you have to have your whole gait analyzed. You just want a shoe that's stable. So for example, a lot of times I recommend a cross training shoe. So not only is it stable in a forward and backward motion, but also side to side. And then that's pretty much what you need in the gym. And how much do you work with people as far as what, what they're eating and their nutrition? All the time. Nutrition is a huge part of getting to any goal, whatever it may be. So I always give nutrition guidance to my clients because that's to be honest, a majority of it sometimes. Because, you know, I, I know a lot of people who are like, okay, I'm working out so I can eat whatever I want. I can eat <laughs> as much chocolate as what I want. Is, is there truth to that? Yeah, that's true. There are people that do that. And to be honest, when someone does start working out, yes, you can splurge a little bit. And that's part of life. I mean, I'm not telling my clients they can't eat anything that they don't love because then it wouldn't be realistic. I mean, <laughs> Thank we all you. have something. We can work together. Right, then. exactly. <laughs> Perfect. But it's about moderation. And you can still enjoy those little pleasures in life it's just about definitely using moderation but if you don't have your diet on track can you get the results you want still you can it's I just like going to take a lot that. of it's just going to take a lot more hard work on the other aspect but nutrition is still a part of it okay because that's what i think about i'm like well it's going to be you know like 20 more reps that i'd have to do to work out that little brownie <laughs> bite i mean is that how it plays out basically not necessarily no it's different with every client it depends on what your goal is it's kind of hard to say in the general terms but nutrition is a huge part of it but you still can get away with eating some of the good stuff okay and um when you have someone how how long does it take when you do the blueprint to get them on track to like where they can actually do the routine you want them to do. Okay, well the blueprint itself usually takes at least an hour, sometimes a little bit more, because I'm really going into the history of the client in regards to medical history, surgeries, uh, physical fitness history, because between all of that and the results that I find, then I'm also finding out what is their goal, because the goal is to get them to where they want to get as quickly as possible, but at the same time I'm kind of help fix and correct at the same time and then we go into a strength program but the assessment itself is about an hour or so okay so you see so you do it in conjunction you like fix them and they don't even know it sometimes that's the case yes. all right well I like that <laughs> I like your style good so when you're thinking about working with a personal trainer you really want someone who is going to do a full assessment on you so whether they call it a body blueprint or whatever you mm -hmm. know a bit full analysis they need to to make sure they're customizing their workout plan for you. We'll be back with more Every Way Woman. There's more to come with Every Way Woman. Are you in Every Way Woman? Are you in Every Way Woman? Welcome back. So I'm here with Jacqueline. Jacqueline. You sent us an email, and in that email, you said that women over 40 are being ignored by the media. Why did you feel you had to send us that email? Why did you have to take the time to write it? Well, it's true, because most fashion, fashion ads and media focuses on youth, youth, youth. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of age out of glamour at 35. We're, if, if we're being advertised to, it's about the, the appliances and the SUVs and the laundry detergent. But a lot of us, when we come of age, when I say you hit your 30s and your 40s and in your stride, this is when you want to really express yourself. Okay. And then we're looking for representation, and we, we don't see it as often as I think we would like to. Okay, so but why did you have to send me the email? Because I know you watched the footage we did um, tell them why we created the show. And when I read the email, I was like, oh, she gets it. <laughs> so, but why did you take the time to write me the email? What were you going through? What were you thinking? Well, I mean, I personally freelance as a fashion model. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, because I'm 45, I don't get to do fashion pictures unless mm -hmm. I do them on my own, which I find absurd because I love clothes. And mm -hmm. I love the artistry of clothes. And I love to express myself through clothes. I'm like, how come I can't see someone who looks like me in the clothing app. Okay, so when you wrote the email, mm -hmm. what was going through your mind? Because you told me, you said, I'm fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all are fabulous. Look at you, look at what you're wearing. I mean, this is amazing. We need representation. So for example, uh, Dr. Ben Berry from Cambridge University, 
did an entire study on this, 2,500 American and Canadian women. And he showed them fashion ads with different models in the same Diane von Fustenberg wrap dress, yes. which she's famous the for. The famous wrap dress, yes. which I love. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but the models was the classic 19-year-old, mm -hmm. very thin Caucasian model. And then he had an older model. He had a plus size model. He had an mm -hmm. uh, ethnic model. Mm -hmm. And he found that when the women looked at these ads, and they're all the same with the beautiful hair and the beautiful makeup, the artistry is the same. When they looked at these ads, their desire to buy the garment went up 200 to 300% if they saw a model that somehow represented them. And he said the fashion industry, th this is his conclusion, fashion industry has it all wrong. Says fashion industry thinks we want to be skinnier, younger versions of ourselves. So how do you feel when you see those ads and you know, you know what, I'd rather see some, another woman that represent my age. Yes. Yeah. You, you tell me you're fabulous, but how do you feel? How does it make you feel when you see another woman that's 19 years old, but you know really you're trying to advertise to a 40-year-old woman? Well, what I mean, goes the, you? the what 19 year old is beautiful. I can acknowledge her for yes. that. But when I see them put Nicole Kidman, who is much closer to my age, mm -hmm. in the ad, I go, oh, look. That's kind of what I would look like in those and clothes. And does it make you want to go out? Yeah. And, because you're being representative. So you feel like yeah. you're not being represented. No, it's it's not very, it's, it's getting better, but it's not very common at this point. Right now, a, a celebrity who's older is starting to appear, and a supermodel who's older is starting to appear. As women, what can we do? Well, we can call for it. This research study called for it. Um, the Dove ads, mm -hmm. there was this massive consumer increase in Dove when they showed the everyday the real, woman. Yeah, the yes. real woman. And I think what's happening is the more that women voice and clamor for this, the more brands will take notice and go, maybe we should include them. Well, you know, as women, we control the pocketbook. We do. We control what comes <laughs> in and out the house we because do. we do the shopping, we, do. we make the list, and we actually we go out and buy it. So kind of the, the um, responsibility of shiftiness can fall on the woman. She doesn't have to buy these products. So as again, as a woman in her 40s, I don't feel like, oh, I'm gonna go buy that because some 19 year old is wearing it. We well, so, can't relate to her because that's your daughter's age. Exactly. And and so I could- And you've been there and done that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I can see basically women, especially above 40, they're so, looking at their granddaughter. Exactly. <laughs> so, so if you had an opportunity yeah. to talk to an advertising agency about, I'm over 40, mm -hmm. I'm fabulous, I want to be represented, represented. Mm -hmm. what would you say to them? You know, I would say it's real easy to make a young girl look amazing in a photograph in a dress mm -hmm. because she has, she has no curves, she has no figure, she has perfect skin. Well, but what, and, what about you? And I would say, you know, I feel like I'm I'm beautiful, I'm mature, I'm wise, and I now want to express myself through garments that I can afford to buy, which I could not afford to buy when I was 20. So the designers, now I can go buy them, but I can't see in the ads or on the runways, how would I look in that dress? Tom Ford, you know Tom Ford. I know who Tom Ford he is. He did an entire runway show with women and actresses of all ages, and he had them sauntering out in the clothes, and, and that's the moment I fell in love with Tom Ford. Perfect. Because he was talking to me. Okay, well thank you very much <laughs> for uh, sharing your experience about being yeah. over 40 and fabulous. And don't go away, we'll be right back with more. I'm an everyday woman, 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 in every way, yeah, yeah. Every Way Woman gives back to the community. Go to everywaywoman.com to find out how you can match our donations of undergarments for needy kids. Thanks for getting to know Every Way Woman. This has been an Every Way Woman I'm production. Every day woman, 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 in every way, yeah, yeah. I'm living my life, 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 living day by day, yeah, yeah. Our you in every way, woman. I'm an everyday woman, 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 in every way. Yeah, yeah, I'm living my life, 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 living day by day. Yeah, yeah. Are you in every way, woman? Every day woman, 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 
in every way Yeah, yeah, I'm living my life, life, life Living day by day, yeah, yeah